Hello and welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. I'm sitting here with Pastor Dan, who just preached a great message on mercy in our blessed series. And we have a couple great questions sent in on postscripts, so stick around at the end. But before that, let's listen to Pastor Dan now. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Bridge. It's great to see all of you here today. As Pastor Ken said, we are in the fourth installment of a sermon series that we're calling Blessed. And in this uh, sermon series, we're considering what is it that constitutes the blessed life. And we have learned that the blessings of God come into our lives as we participate in the kingdom of God. It is our citizenship in the kingdom that is the conduit through which God's blessings come into our lives. So what do we mean by the kingdom of God? That's a phrase we see most frequently in the Gospel of Matthew. Perhaps the clearest explanation that we have of the kingdom is found in Matthew in chapters five through seven. By the way, that's where we're gonna be this morning. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. Uh, The ushers coming down the aisle, they'll be glad to give you one. And if you don't own a Bible, please accept that as a gift. That can be yours to keep. We will be reading in just a moment from Matthew chapter 5. These three verses uh, are referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, among other things, Jesus helps us understand that the kingdom is not uh, a geographical entity. It's not a a physical reality. Rather, it is a spiritual reality. It's something that we enter into when we enter into a relationship with the King, with Jesus Christ. When we are connected to Him, we become citizens of the kingdom. And at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the portion that we refer to as the Beatitudes, Jesus provides for us eight characteristics of kingdom citizens. Eight characteristics that uh, should mark our priorities, our values, our attitudes, the way we live, our behavior, uh, everything about us should be uh, consonant with these eight characteristics that he outlines. Last week, Pastor Ken uh, helped us understand one of those characteristics, blessed are the peacemakers. He did a fantastic job with that. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I encourage you to go back and give that a listen. Today, we're going to look at yet another of those eight characteristics. But before we do that, I I wanted to just sort of pull off to the side of the road and uh, offer a word of caution a word of warning, if you will, regarding the characteristics as a whole. I think it is easy for us, if if we're not careful, to begin to view uh, the Beatitudes, these eight characteristics, as what you might call noble aspirations. In other words, we, we read these and we think to ourselves, you know, that's a good thought, Jesus was really a smart guy. Those are are some wonderful ideas he's putting forth. And then we ask, hey, what's for lunch? And we're not really too concerned. We don't spend too much time thinking about, so how do I take these characteristics and, and put them into action? How do I make them a reality in my life? How do I get past simply agreeing with Jesus that, yes, that's a, that's a good thought, that's a good notion, and then stepping out and living it? Because that's what Jesus intended to happen, is that it would get beyond our brain and into our lives and that we would begin to live them out and demonstrate for the world at large, this is what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Today, we're going to be looking at one of those characteristics that, uh, by name anyway, we don't talk about very much, but it has some very practical implications for our lives. We are in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let's pray together. 
Father, how grateful we are for the opportunity and the privilege we have to gather here this morning in complete freedom and with no fear whatsoever to be able to lift up the name of your son Jesus and worship him in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're mindful of the fact that there are millions of people around the globe who don't have such freedom, who choose to worship you even at the risk of their lives. We pray your blessings upon those persons and help us, O oh God, to be good stewards of this privilege that we have. As we turn our attention to your word, we pray now that your spirit would come to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So, mercy isn't a word that we use a lot these days, except maybe in an exclamation of some point, you know, mercy, goodness, that was such a terrible thing that happened. Or perhaps it conjures up notions of a lordly ruler addressing a wayward servant and extending mercy to this servant who chose to do the wrong sort of thing. It's not a, a common word, but the idea behind it, the concept behind it is quite relevant to our lives and has some very uh, practical implications and uh, the possibility for application in everyday life. So what did Jesus mean by that word mercy? Well, simply put, mercy is compassion moving to action. Compassion moving to action. To be merciful is not simply to observe someone in need and to think to yourself, oh my goodness, what a difficult and painful situation that must be, and then turn and go in the other direction. No, to be merciful is to observe and then to act, to move near, to address the need, whether that need be financial, material, physical, the need of forgiveness, whatever the need may be, a merciful heart not only notices and not only is moved by it emotionally, spiritually, but is also moved to get up and do something to address that need. This came home to me in a powerful way. Back in my 20s, I worked as an electrician back in those days. And um, most of the time, I would describe my working environments as being rather nasty and dirty. I was a low man on the totem pole at this particular company, and so if anybody had to crawl down into the gunky areas, that usually wound up being me. And I remember on one very hot August Atlanta day, I was working at a concrete plant up on the north side of town. I was down in the tunnel underneath the plant where they stored all the materials, uh, running some conduit, doing some wiring and things. And uh, throughout the course of the day, I did just get filthy, dirty, nasty, mud and, and all the rest. And by quitting time, I could not wait to get home, get out of those dirty clothes, get a shower and get cool. So I hopped in my truck and took off home. I got on 285, the perimeter around Atlanta, which is otherwise known as the Indianapolis Speedway and I'm cruising with the traffic doing 70, 75 miles an hour when I, off to my right, I notice there's a car on the side of the road. And standing at the back of the car is an elderly couple uh, looking at a flat tire, looking at it as though maybe just maybe it'll fix itself if we stand <laughs> here long enough. And, and as I drove by, I thought to myself, oh, Oh my goodness, what a terrible thing to happen. How unfortunate. Can't wait to get home. And it was at that moment that the Lord said, Dan, Dan, what are you thinking? Pull over. I was about a half a mile down the road at that point. I, I pulled over and got out and walked back to where they were. And uh, I, I think I scared them at first because I was so filthy, you know, but I... <laughs> Stuck my palms out in a gesture of peace <laughs> and uh, said, hey, can I, can I help you folks? And oh, they just looked so relieved. The, 
The gentleman was in a suit and his wife was in a pretty dress. They were on their way to some function of their grandkids and um, had this flat tire. You know, traffic is just roar. It's loud. It's hot. It's dangerous. And uh, they, they weren't just helpless. They were scared. And uh, he said to me, son, I'm going to be honest with you. I have never changed a tire in my life, but I'll be glad to stay here and help you if I can. And I said, you know what I think would be better? I said, how about if you and your wife get back in the car, make sure it's in park, <laughs> push that emergency brake in good and strong, and let crank the car, let's get the air going so you guys can stay in the cool, and I'll take care of this tire. We'll get you going here in just a jiffy. Okay, thank you. So, so that's what we did. Got it fixed, wasn't any big deal. Walked up to the window and he was just profuse in his thanks, and she was crying, thank you so much. He tried to offer me money, like, nah, I'm going to take your money, just, you know. Well, they went on their way, and I went on mine. I still had another 20, 25 minutes to get home. And as I reflected on that experience, uh, the Spirit was doing business with me, basically saying to me, Dan, th this is what it means to be a follower of mine. To be observant, to notice there are people in this world who have needs. It is not all about you. And I tried to plead, Lord, you know I'm ADD, but he wasn't having any of that. <laughs> no, wake up. Wake up and notice there are needs out there. And do what you can to meet them. Compassion, moving toward action. Now, why is this such a big deal for Jesus? You know, he's, he's listed eight characteristics. Why does he include mercy in one of the top eight? What is it that's so significant about mercy? Well, I think several things are significant for us who are kingdom citizens. For starters, it is we of all people who should fully appreciate and understand just how important mercy is because we have been the recipients of the greatest mercy imaginable. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ extended to us. Look down upon our sinful estate, our brokenness, our rebellion from God and did not ignore us, did not punish us, though we deserved it, but rather moved toward us not only compassionate, but moving toward action, moving toward us and loving us. And the cross stands tall as a reminder that our God is a God of compassion, who doesn't stand with arms crossed, who doesn't choose to ignore, but chooses to move toward those in need. We of all people should understand the significance and the importance of mercy, of compassion moving toward action. But there's another reason why it's so significant, and that is human relationships would be impossible without it. Human relationships would be impossible without mercy. Why? Because you and I are broken, sinful creatures and we are going to hurt each other. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because of our brokenness and our sinfulness, we're going to do damage to each other. We're going to betray one, let one another down, be dishonest, be unkind, be impatient, whatever the case may be. We're going to do bad things to each other. And the only possibility of reconciliation and repair comes through mercy when the other person is standing in need of forgiveness and we are willing to extend that to them. That's what makes relationships possible. And the more serious the relationship, the more necessary mercy is. I think it is a, a fair and accurate statement to say that marriage in one sense of the word, is really just moving from one act of forgiveness to the next, right on through our lives. Now, I'm not suggesting that 
all marriage is. There's many more things to it than that. And this nervous <laughs> laughter, yeah, yeah, because you know I'm right. If you've been married for more than six months and you're not a liar, you really know I'm right. <laughs> Mercy is absolutely imperative if we are to remain in relationship. Without it, we are broken and separated. Mercy is also important because we don't know what's going to happen to us from day to day. Who knows what may befall us later today or tomorrow? We may be on the top of the world today, but tomorrow it can be a completely different scenario. In the recent government shutdown, the, the refrain that I heard many times on the news was these poor folks saying, I never dreamed this would happen to me. I, I have always paid my bills. I've, I've, I've never been able to... Uh, not provide for my family. I never imagined this would happen to me. And that's not limited to government workers, friends. That can happen to any of us. We are all just a few unfortunate incidents away from being in a bad fix. Financially, physically, emotionally, relationally, however... Jesus said something interesting, blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. Now, most of us hear that and we tend to think, well, right, I need to be merciful now so later on God will be merciful to me. And yes, that's part of it, but that's not the whole story. Jesus, I think, is giving us a very important life principle here. It works on the horizontal plane as well. It is woven into the fabric of the universe that the merciful receive mercy. Another way you could put it is what goes around comes around. And if we choose to live our lives as merciful individuals who are observant of the needs of others and move from compassion toward action, we can expect mercy in our own lives. That's just the way life works. Why is mercy so important? It's important because we have been the recipients of the greatest mercy ever shown. It's important because if we're to have any hope of relationships, mercy must be present. And if we want to receive mercy in our lives, both here and now and then later, We've got to be merciful people. We've got to be demonstrating that we are kingdom citizens through our mercy. So how do we do that? How do we go about demonstrating mercy as kingdom citizens? Well, we do it just like the king did and does. Jesus is our model when it comes to mercy. And as we look at the life of Jesus, his earthly ministry and his ministry toward us today, we see that among other things, our mercy needs to be unconditional. You'll notice that when Jesus spoke this beatitude, there are no parameters that go with it. He didn't make any reference to um, the color of one's skin. He didn't say, be merciful to those who are like you or to those that you like. He didn't make any reference to socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, documented or undocumented, rich or poor, old or young. It, no, th there are no conditions there at all. If we observe a need and it is within our power to meet that need, the expectation is that we will do what we can to meet that need. And if there are other factors involved, well, then we'll let God take care of that. Why should we be unconditional? Because that's the way Jesus loved us. And thank goodness he did. Because just 
think the pickle we would be in if Jesus had said, my mercy comes to those who have earned it, to those who are worthy of it, to those who deserve it. None of us would be on the receiving end. Not one. And that's why he says to us, just as I have loved you unconditionally, so I am expecting you will love others unconditionally. We're also to show mercy intentionally, purposefully. Nobody had to beg or plead or even ask Jesus to come after us. Scripture says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came looking for us and our lostness. We didn't even know we were lost. But he came looking for us anyway. And he calls upon us as kingdom citizens to be intentional about demonstrating mercy to others. To be looking for those opportunities. We have a guy on our staff, uh, his name is uh, John McDonald, and uh, John is a, a wonderful person. We are blessed to have him as a member of our staff here at Faith Bridge. Um, for years and years now, we've had a ministry at Faith Bridge called Helping Hands, and it's a ministry that comes alongside uh, widows and single moms and really anybody that has a a need for some basic house repair and can't do it themselves. We move in and provide materials and labor and so forth to get things patched up. And for the first six or seven years of that ministry, it was all volunteer driven. And the volunteers did an awesome job. Thankful for every single one of them. But because they're volunteers, you know, they had other responsibilities. And so the ministry was limited to a degree. But then along came Harvey, and oh my goodness, we could see pretty quickly, um, we're going to have to make this a staff position because the needs are simply overwhelming. Well, eventually, the Harvey business came to an end, and so we began to evaluate and ask, should we continue to fund this position as a paid position? Should we go back to volunteers? Ultimately, ultimately we decided no. Uh, we, we need someone in this role, a paid person to provide leadership. And that's what John does for us. He leads helping hands. Part of my job at Faith Bridge is uh, I'm responsible for various ministries. And at the end of each month, I, I look at the expenditures of those ministries just to make sure everything's copacetic and that money is being spent appropriately. Well, I was looking at the helping hands budget uh, expenditures at the end of one month and and I'm noticing even though most of the Harvey stuff is uh, dealt with, still we're, we're spending it at, at Harvey levels to help people. And I'm thinking to myself, what on earth is going on here? But then it didn't take long for me to figure out the reason that was happening is because John McDonald is a premier example of intentional mercy. John doesn't come in here and sit by the phone and drum his fingers and wait for somebody to call and say, hey, I have a need. No, he gets in his truck and he's out cruising around looking for opportunities to meet needs. That's why the expenditures have remained high and praise the Lord that they have because every expenditure is a blessing towards someone who had a need, a need that we could meet. How intentional are you and observing the needs of others. Are you moving through life with your head down, nose to the grindstone, doing what you've got to do to keep the wolf away from the door, provide for your family, do what you've got to do? Or from time to time, can you look up and look around and see, you know what, it's not all about me. I could do this for that person, and I could do this for that person. Mercy should be intentional. And then finally, I think it is imperative that we understand that mercy will always, to some degree, be sacrificial. It's going to cost us something to be merciful. In some instances, a little. In some instances, a lot. 
but there will always be a cost involved. We see this most clearly in the cross of Christ. His act of mercy cost him his life, but he gave it freely. And if we are going to be merciful to those around us in need, we need to understand there will be a cost involved. We'll have to sacrifice something. But here's what we need to keep in mind. You see, the kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of this world. In the kingdom of this world, cost means loss. But in the kingdom of God, cost means blessing. That's what the cross teaches us. It was the highest price ever paid for anything, but the blessings will go on through eternity for you and for me and for all who have entered into the kingdom. And when we are merciful as citizens of the kingdom, whatever it may cost us, it will ultimately prove to be blessing. One of the most beautiful examples of this um, took place through some very tragic circumstances uh, with a Faith Bridge family. Some of you are aware of the uh, Ham family, John and Shannon Ham. Back on August the 10th, 2016, their college age son, Ryan, was driving back to Oklahoma to school when he was hit head on by a drunk driver, Johnny Morton. Uh, Johnny escaped with minor injuries, but Ryan lost his life. And it's hard really to imagine what John and Shannon and the other kids have been through these last two years as the legal system, you know, moved along looking forward to a day of justice. Well, that day finally came back in December. And when it was over, John uh, recorded some words in his journal. And he gave me permission to share them with you today. Shannon and I sat across from Johnny Morton on Wednesday. His defense attorney broke the silence. She shared that Johnny had completed several sobriety programs and joined the Victims Impact Group, a group that tells their story in hopes of prevention. Johnny has joined Warriors for Christ, a group which meets every Wednesday. Johnny looked up in tears and said that he has written a letter to us and crumbled it up so many times. He confessed he didn't know what to say, and he has brought so much hurt to his own family and us He was in a dark place and doesn't have the words for the pain he caused us. He kept looking down in shame. We could tell he was struggling with his words and deeply broken. I asked Johnny if he had a son and he said, yes, he's six years old. He had him at 20. I shared that I had Ryan at 21. And I shared that for the last few years, I had been studying miracles. I had searched the Bible for answers and read C.S. Lewis. Why didn't God save Ryan? I told Johnny that I have concluded that on that night, the, the collision was so horrific that both of them should be dead. Johnny's truck flipped, caught fire, and he was ejected onto the street. But he walked away with a minor head injury. There was a miracle that night. I don't pretend to understand how God sorts these things out. I told Johnny that I had forgiven him, and he broke down in tears. Johnny left the room, and the next hour was so full of emotion and discussion as we spoke with the district attorney. What is forgiveness? What about justice and consequences? What is true restoration? Is he being genuine? What would Ryan want? Back in the courtroom, the judge looked at Johnny and told him, you have been sentenced to 35 years, 20 years in prison and 15 years probation. In my years of sitting at this bench, I have never modified a murder case to this degree. You need to realize the faith and mercy of the victim's family and the support of your family. This is truly a Christmas miracle. Your sentence is now modified to 20 years, five in prison, and 15 years out of prison, 
with a mandatory six-month inpatient rehabilitation center upon release. Don't let this blow up in your face. Johnny turned around and looked at Shannon and I with tears in his eyes. Johnny's parents and family broke out in tears as he walked back toward us, shackled at the hands and feet. He reached out and held Shannon's hand as she was deep in tears, and he told her he would not disappoint her. Shannon pulled out her iPhone and showed him a picture of our family. She said, this is why we made this decision. She looked him in the eyes and said, I want a letter from you every year for the rest of your life telling us how you became something. Shannon's and my intention had been to make sure the judge upheld the harsher sentence. But there was so much more that happened that day. So many signs, small quirky details, genuine moments, and even our conservative district attorney was moved. Ryan is gone. We love and miss him so much. We pray that Johnny will build a meaningful relationship with his son at a young age, that he continues his faith walk and lives a great life. Shannon hopes that he will write as promised. Johnny's life is between him and God now. We are at peace. That, my friends, is mercy. On a scale that most of us would find difficult to imagine. But you know, all of us have occasions to extend mercy to others. Life's just that way. It's up and it's down. And we see people in need all the time. Some are in need of our forgiveness. Some need our help financially. Some need our help physically. Some need our help spiritually. But we got to pay attention if we're going to meet those needs and be merciful. And so I thought it would be appropriate if we finished out today by giving the Lord a chance to whisper to our hearts and perhaps remind us of opportunities that are there. Maybe there is someone you need to forgive. Maybe there's someone that you simply need to lend a hand to. I, I don't know what the case may be. But in your bulletin, you'll find a, a card like this. And if, if you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand. Our ushers will give you a card and a pen. And, and we're going to close the service in, in a moment of prayer, asking God to place on our hearts where He wants us to show mercy where he wants us to reveal our kingdom citizenship to someone that is in need. I'm going to, to pray over us, and then we're going to uh, have just a few moments of silence so that you can do business with God and hear his voice. And whatever he prompts you to do, write it down on the card and take it with you. Put it on your fridge or mirror or in your vehicle, somewhere that you'll see it so that you don't just have a good thought and then leave it behind, but that it becomes compassion moving toward action. Will you pray with me, please? Father, how grateful we are that when we stood in the most desperate circumstances of all, you came looking for us and you paid the highest price to show mercy and to rescue us. I pray now, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and reveal to us what you would have us do, perhaps even this week, someone to forgive, someone to help, someone to bless. Speak to our hearts in the quietness of these moments. And I pray for each person as they write that prompting down, that it would not become something that is forgotten, but rather, by your grace, it stays in the forefront of our minds so that our compassion can become action as well. Why don't you take the next 
few moments and let God speak to your heart. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to FaithBridge. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at FaithBridge. I'm sitting here with Pastor Dan, who just preached a message on mercy in our blessed series. And we have a couple questions in, uh, so we dive into those right away. Let's do it. All right, the first one we have in says, You mentioned the principle underneath this beatitude is what goes around comes around. However, it seems that there are any number of exceptions to this in Scripture. Job would be the an example of a godly man who went through tremendous suffering, or more importantly, that of all of us who have been shown mercy in Christ, despite the fact that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus said that even though we are forgiven and reconciled to God, we will still experience trial and even persecution, sometimes explicitly because we follow Jesus. So I'm struggling to reconcile your comment, which sounds very much like the idea of karma, with so many examples in Scripture that seem contrary. Can you help me out on that? Yeah, I think I can. Um, first, I would say the issue this individual is addressing is suffering. Mm -hmm. I, I was not talking about suffering. I was mm -hmm. talking about meeting needs. And the point was, if you're the kind of person who's inclined to meet the needs of others, mm -hmm. you can probably expect that the same is going to come back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my statements uh, similar to um, statements made in the book of Proverbs w were not intended to be a hard fast. It will happen this way 100% guaranteed. Right. You know, uh, just looking at one proverb, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe not. Does that make that untrue? Well, not necessarily, but I think as a general life principle, if you are a need-meeting person, you can expect similar behavior from others, whereas if you're not, if you're selfish <laughs> and unwilling mm -hmm. to meet the needs of others, chances are pretty good it's not going to come back to you. Right. That makes sense. That's a good uh, comparison between those two, suffering versus mercy. There aren't directly the same. Exactly, yeah. Well, the other question we have in says, what are the differences between mercy, grace, and servanthood? Good question. And um, they are all uh, closely related. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would not draw clear lines of demarcation between them because they sometimes are used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. But if I were to point out some differences, I would say... Grace has to do with unmerited favor. Okay. Uh, it, it, the grace of God is coming to you uh, wh whether you deserve it or not. Mercy, on the other hand, <clears throat> is an action that one takes simply because that's what you're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, we, we are commanded to be merciful. And so that's an action that we move toward. And I would characterize servanthood as the expression of mercy. Okay. That's what you do when you are being merciful. You are serving someone else. Wonderful. Well, sweet. That's, uh, that's great. Easy. Very helpful. Good. Wonderful. I mean, that was a great sermon. I know it was uh, a blessing to hear that story of the Ham family. Whew. It is yeah. such a wonderful Powerful. example of, of mercy put into Real action for sure. Yeah. So thank you, Pastor Dan, uh, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you back next week as we continue the Blessed series. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.